Hello, uh, everyone, and a very good evening to you. My name is Dave Robbins, and I'm an assistant professor in the School of Communications at DCU. I'm one of the editors of the book we're launching tonight uh, on an unsuspecting public. Firstly, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to you all, and thank you for taking the time to join us this evening. I hope you, I hope you enjoy the event and that you'll find it interesting. We expect to, um, to be talking for about 40 minutes, and if you'd like to tweet about uh, what we're talking about and about the book, please use the hashtag climate change IRL. Uh, before I introduce our four speakers, I'd like to say a few words about our book. Ireland and the Climate Crisis is the first comprehensive account and analysis of Ireland's performance on climate change across a number of different societal arenas. The impetus for the book is the idea that climate change is no longer an environmental problem alone. It's a social problem and it requires solutions to come from the whole of society. So we need to understand the contributions that policy can make, that the media can make, that politicians can make, that activists, teachers, eco-villagers, community energy groups, trade unions, and even eco-cinema can make. And we need, we need ways to think about climate action and to talk about it, to bring in concepts like eco-modernism, political ecology, the just transition into the debate. The transition to a sustainable zero carbon society will requir require policies, of course, and instruments such as taxes and incentives and direct intervention by the state. But these changes will not be accepted and there will be limited buy-in unless other less instrumentalist approaches go with them. So this book is about showing what the social sciences and humanities can contribute to Ireland's efforts to leave behind its laggard reputation on climate change. So now that I hope I've whetted your appetite for the book, we have a bit of good news. Um, it turns out that the publishers have included the title in their Christmas holiday sale. So it's on sale for just $19.99. So if you search for a Palgrave holiday sale, you'll find the link and you'll be able to, to, um, to buy the book. So let me move on to the main business of the evening. And I'd like briefly to introduce our four speakers. We are delighted to have Eamon Ryan, the Minister for Environment, Climate, Transport and Communications, to officially launch the book. Eamon and myself are old friends. We met in UCD in the 1980s uh, when we shared a locker in the basement of the arts block. Back then, we thought ministerial mercs were for throwing eggs at. I have to confess that I have been pretty shameless in leveraging my friendship with Eamon to get him to launch various things over the years. Some have worked out well, like another book he launched for me last year, and some not so well. I was just remembering that he launched my doomed campaign when I stood for the Greens in the local elections in 2009. So thanks for answering the call again tonight, and you're very welcome, Minister. We're also delighted to have the president of our university, Professor Dara Kyo, with us. Dara has shown a real leadership in sustainability at DCU, both in the university's operations, its teaching and its research. And thank you for being with us, Dara. We are also really pleased to have two other distinguished guest speakers. The first is Dr. Tara Shine, the director of Change by Degrees. Tara has just been appointed by the UN to be the co-facilitator of the Structured Expert Dialogue under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And we're not the only ones to have a book out, by the way. I can highly recommend <clears throat> Tara's book, How to Save Your Planet One Object at a Time. We were just talking that we might try and do some sort of two for one offer that we can talk about afterwards, Tara. And we're also delighted to welcome Mark Foley, CEO of the Airgrid, Airgrid Group, which is centrally involved in, green, in the greening of El Ireland's electricity grid. Mark has been supportive of our attempt to bring attention to the social science and humanities dimensions of climate change at DCU, and has attended events related to our MSc in climate change policy, media and society. So there are speakers tonight, and I hope you enjoy what they have to say. Um, I'm going to finish up by saying a few brief words of thanks. Uh, firstly, to my co-editors, Dermot Torney of the School of Law and Government and Pat Brereton of the School of Communications. Um, they are great friends and colleagues, and they do a nice sideline in crisis and trauma communication, if you ever need that sort of thing. And also to our chapter authors, 
whose expertise, judgment and deep thinking about Ireland and climate change shines through this book. Lastly, may I thank Claire Connell and Therese O'Farrell in the President's Office and Claire Egan in the Marketing Section for helping to organise and promote this event. I'm going to hand over to Dara now and Dara will introduce the Minister. Then I will come back to introduce the other speakers. So thanks again for, for logging in um, to listen to us tonight and I'll hand over to you, Dara. Thank you very much, uh, David, for that uh, introduction. It's uh, wonderful to be here this evening to celebrate. Um, I'd like to thank uh, everybody who has joined in. Um, we're still coming in. We're up to 210 people with us now. Um, it's fantastic. I'm especially pleased to welcome the Minister tonight, uh, Eamon Ryan, who has a, a wonderful title and responsibility, Minister for the Environment, Climate, Communication and Transport. Um, it's fantastic to have you with us, Minister, and I'm very pleased as well to echo David's welcome for our distinguished uh, speakers, Mark Foley, who's the CEO of Airgrid, and Tara Shine, who's the Director of Change by Degrees. Um, th these are people who, in their daily life, make massive contribution to the planet uh, in terms of their responsibilities, but their influence and uh, impact. So we're delighted to have you. Um, it's great to have everybody here and so many people with us. Again, the numbers are rising for the launch of this Ireland and the climate crisis. I'm very conscious that David pointed out Tara's uh, book, but there's also a rival event on uh, as we speak simultaneously. Uh, our colleague Pather Kirby is launching uh, his book. So I know some of you will be smart and have a second device on in the room, but congratulations to Pather uh, on his book too. I'd especially like to congratulate the editors, uh, Dave, who introduced us early, uh, Pat Brereton and Dermot Torney. Um, delighted and very proud of your achievement. This book is very closely aligned with the strategic goals of the university. Uh, our old uh, strategic plan placed sustainability at the core of the university and it was called out as one of our goals. We're currently revising the plan in the light of COVID and sustainability will be taken out as a goal and placed as a foundation. So all of our activities will be founded on our desire uh, and the imperative on us all to be sustainable in, in our actions. So it's wonderful uh, to see a university like ours and the way in which our colleagues across the disciplines are engaging with the global challenge and the, the local challenge in front of us all. There was great excitement this week when our colleague James Carton from School of, uh, from Engineering and Computing, welcomed the new hydrogen bus uh, to the university. Of course, the great thing is that the, that bus will be trialled in the city, but that its performance while in Dublin will be uh, analysed at the uh, at DCU and by our colleagues at, in Insight, the SFI funded Insight Centre. So again, it's a great example of the way in which the whole university community is behind uh, this massive challenge for us all to protect the world, our common home. And in that context, that DCU was ranked number 84 in the world in terms of the Times Higher uh, Impact Ratings. And of course, all of our actions are measured against and are aligned to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, it's wonderful to, to see that. Um, I'd particularly like to thank the uh, our sustainability manager, Sam Fahey, who's with us tonight. And just this week, our executive signed off on a new uh, environmental plan for the university. We look forward to implementing that. Uh, all of our three academic campuses have achieved on Tashka uh, green campus status. And just today, we received handover from the builders of a new library uh, on All Hallows campus in Woodlock Hall, which is a collaboration with the Jesuits to house their library from Milltown Park. And there in this new library, we're trialing um, new environmentally uh, sensitive technologies. Um, as a historian, uh, I'm always very conscious the way our colleagues in STEM can manage to claim credit for so much in the, in the world. Uh, and I'm very pleased that this book focuses on the contribution that uh, uh, our, our disciplines can make, social sciences and the humanities, in creating a low carbon and sustainable society. I'm pleased to, to welcome the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Humanities, uh, Professor John, John Doyle, is with us. Um, DCU has a very strong track record in the teaching 
uh, around uh, environmental issues. And David has already mentioned our MSc in climate change, policy, media and society. And we also plan to establish a new centre, the DCU Centre for Climate and Society here. So it is wonderful to explore, as this volume does, how the social sciences and humanities can help us understand, communicate importantly, and collaborate and address climate change. And of course, at our university, we do so with our colleagues in the STEM disciplines as well. This book is truly interdiscip interdisciplinary, uh, transdisciplinary, I think is probably a better way to describe it. And it brings together our strengths at DCU uh, in areas such as media, film, communications, politics, policy, political economy, legal activism, community energy, eco-villages, local government, political ecology, eco-modernism, and of course, uh, teacher education. Uh, all of these are critical in how, as we say, we create our new world. Um, but we're not just uh, insular. You couldn't say we, we may aim to be insulated, but we will never be insular at DCU. So I'm pleased to have colleagues contribute to the volume from UL, from Queen's, from UCD, from UCC, from Trinity Maynooth. Uh, and I'm very pleased to know too that since his contribution to this essay was submitted, the volume that one of our contributors has in fact been appointed as a full cabinet minister. So congratulations, minister. This is an invaluable uh, contribution to debate and to the field and one that will make enormous impact. Uh, as David said at the, at the outset, it's the first comprehensive assessment of the responsibility to climate change across the, all the areas that we have mentioned. I'm delighted to congratulate everybody involved. It is really an invaluable source to anybody interested in the field. Uh, as David said, it's available now for uh, 20 euro as part of the Christmas sale of Palgrave. Uh, and uh, if people don't rise to buying it, they could make huge impact by ordering it at their local libraries as well. Um, this new government of ours, this coalition, is focused on the big issues. It's the first government in the history of the state to have a, a ministry devoted to higher education and research. Uh, we report that minister, and Simon Harris says that his department has 10 words in it. It's the, the longest uh, name title for any government department, but uh, he reduces it to three words, talent, skills and the future. Um, Simon Harris has enormous responsibility, uh, and, uh, but he can sleep at night. Uh, Eamon Ryan's ministry has a, a, an even greater responsibility, I think, for us all to be minister responsible for the environment alone would be hugely significant for climate, for communications, uh, and of course, for our favourite subject in Ireland, for transport. Uh, is a massive responsibility. But I know that, as David has said, one that he has demonstrated lifelong commitment to, he has invested uh, his life uh, in it, and we wish him all the very best uh, in that ministry and to assure him of the support of the university. We're really proud that he's been able to take time tonight to launch this volume. volume. And I'd like, uh, on behalf of the university, to welcome Minister Ryan to uh, DCU to launch, as I say, which is a, a milestone publication in the history of Irish scholarship and uh, environmental issues. So, Minister Falteroth. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you, David. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, I'm, I'm just come out of the Shannad. We've had a, we, we had a debate on the uh, well, statements on the uh, 2019 climate uh, performance of the state as is required under the 2015 Act. Um, it would give you some hope it would give you a sense that there is a chance for consensus and ambition for action in this issue. And uh, maybe that will flavor or, or color my comments. Um, my hope is added to the fact that David, uh, as man you've managed to get this book out for 1999, get the last of the hardback copies uh, of Ireland, the climate crisis for that price. Um, Cause I think this book can make a contribution. Um, it's similar, I, I, what, the way I put it is we've had a citizen assembly that was important in, very important in the change in that sense of culture or um, consensus around climate action. This is a similar, this is a, similar to an academic assembly. It's people who I think Connor uh, Little describes in his chapter in the book as, as the climate change policy community set out before us. And they're set out before us, as I understand, David, you were asking the question, could Ireland be an example? Or what could Ireland, 
Why would we write about Ireland? What, what is there to tell? And I think it's very impressive, uh, dear Matorny, and no, no doubt has the contacts uh, to get Lorient to Vienna to be able to write the foreword. Because in her short foreword, I think she puts the question very well, can we in Ireland address this challenge? She very accurately assesses that the really biggest challenge in that regard is probably in the areas of agriculture and transport, which we see reflected later on in each chapter of the book. And, but I think she makes the case, which I think we, we know to be true, that small as we are, if we can show ability, and if we, the worst laggard, can like a prodigal son or daughter return home to actually being a leader, that would be a very significant story, not just for ourselves, but for the wider world, or could be potentially. I want to briefly just reflect, I, um, on, on, and I won't go into every single chapter or every um, single contribution, and it's partly difficult because I know most of the contributors and have worked with them and count them as close friends. Um, but I want to just pick up a few strains or a few thoughts that come from my reading of the book, just to share and be interested to hear what others have to say. Um, because I think it comes back to the question, as David has put it, particularly in the social sciences, particularly I would believe in the, in the media education sphere and the world of education, what, how do we tell the story? How do we inspire? How do we inspire into action? And it's interesting because the way the book is structured, as I read it, is each of these people involved in the climate policy community, more often academic than not, but set out their, I suppose, relevant work, their, some of their key research. And in a sense, that provides a quilt or a certain pattern which might help us answer the question. First, the, three, the first, rightly, I think, appropriately, first chapter is given to John Sweeney. And actually, it reminded me that in addressing this issue and getting the messaging right and getting the, what you call, David, I think, in your previous book, or the framing of it, I, for me anyway, personally, it's still the science that frames it. It's still sometimes when John Sweeney's detailed analysis showing the potential changes we're seeking, seeing. The, the winter's getting wetter in the north and west of our country, the summer's getting drier. And the impact that would have on agriculture in a whole range of different ways, you can't get away from the core story being a science one, being on, needing to know the details and whether that's going into the fact that as, as John Sweeney writes, in the likes of Wexford, we could be losing a meter of coastline a year, I presume, in the sand dune systems, are the fact, as he says, with this changing climate, it's the green spruce aphid or the great spruce bark beetle that we have to look out for. It's that level of detail as to what's actually happening in the natural world is still, in my mind, for me personally, the thing that moves me or calls me into action. It's concern about the, what the science is telling us. And I think we still always, in politics, in the telling of this story, Yes, we need to make it emotional. Yes, we need to win the heart as the head, but we also need to be, to be true to the science and, and use that as a, as a framing that I think still is urgent, is needed. Saiva Neil and Edwin Alblas go into what I think has been one of the interesting developments. Um, it's in the role of the legal system in this process. And my colleague, now Minister Roderick O'Gorman, uh, as you say, is, is similarly sets out his understanding of the climate law and how that's evolved and what role it has. Two or three points, if I could. One of the things that really stood out to me, I hadn't really followed it in sufficient detail to understand it, but I do now, now, now see it, is how that your gender case, the Dutch case, so closely mirrored our own, or ours maybe mirrored theirs, maybe is better in, in sequencing but particularly because of its reference to the UN Convention of Human Rights, the placing this in that most fundamental constitutional structure. We don't have constitutional legal rights for our environment. We probably, it's a very good case on my mind, to, I could have a long discussion with Roderick and others as to how we would actually do it. But the way the court, the which the courts have interpreted the UN Convention, the European Convention on Human Rights in that regard, I think is really significant because it's placing us again center of the environment. It's placing the risk to our security, our very life uh, forms uh, as the case and need for, for the policymakers, the political system to address the climate crisis really just came home to me in a very clear way in re reading those two, two uh, chapters. 
I was saying there's a lot of controversy out there at the moment in relation to our own climate law. I was saying to our senators, several of whom are involved in the Joint Rocks Committee working on it, that I think what's happening at the moment in our Arctis Committee is actually a continuation of what's worked well in the last three years. Connor Little and others and Roderick set out the evolution that's happened in the last three or four years with our Citizens Assembly, the Joint Arctis Committee, and Richard Bruton, in fairness to him, delivering a climate action plan in 2019, all of which were progressive steps. I think what's happening in the Joint Arctis Committee at the moment is a similar progressive step unusual one in that we're using the pre-legislative scrutiny process to effectively parse through line by line, word by word, uh, what the legislation intent is. But I think from that we can get, as I said, my sense from coming out of the Shannon just now, is actually this will build further consensus in the political system. And such consensus in the political system is the key requirement for further progress. I don't think the legal system would be able to achieve the scale of change. They won't be able to decide on the prioritization of resources or how we make sure that, that uh, it's delivered in the most efficient and socially just manner. That has to come from the political system. The legal system has a critical role and the Climate Case Ireland has set this out as a protection should the, should the political system fail to address that, that core function. But actually getting it right is up in the separation of powers for the political system as representatives of the people to make that call. And I believe we will be able to do that. It's one of the, I suppose, things that gives me hope that in this country we may well be on the right path. It'll take time. It requires a running jump and a leap, not just a walk along that path. But I believe it is deliverable. One of the most powerful chapters for me personally was Declan Fahey's. I hadn't, I'll be honest, I hadn't really heard that term eco-modernism before. I'll be honest, I was slightly skeptical. I don't know, there's something in the similarity or familiarity with words like postmodernism or others that kind of made me less, less than certain about it. But actually, in, as I read his chapter and, and put the context of what we have to do, it for me was a really interesting, a really interesting contribution. And in some ways, I think more than anything else, it was interesting because it, it set out perspective how I think we can pull together various different views, different strands of opinion within the environmental community to support the scale of change we need, even if there's differences on how radical or how much of an inside or outside position one takes and that. He quotes John Barry, who writes in a, in a subsequent chapter, that that eco-modernism eco um, quote here, uh, the people will not vote democratically, quote again, for a completely different type of society and economy. But he argues that eco-modernism had value as a foundation for the future development of more radical environmental policies. It's that sense I have that consensus is important, that even when there's difference, and there are differences of opinion as to what the economic path, what the prioritization, uh, what the very political approach should be, it still needs, or we need a mechanism where there's still consensus on the, on the general direction that we're, we are taking and the need for that. And while it very much is open to criticism, it's open to different in, in interpretation, We've seen in Ireland that when we collectively uh, have a sense of direction that we want to go, that actually through that consensus approach, we can deliver change very effectively as a country. And I don't believe we're far away from that. I think we're actually near to it. And that's what I think we need to foster while respecting difference at the same time. In regard to David Robinson's contribution, and I can't go without passing that, yes, we are close friends, and yes, we shared a locker in UCD down by the trap, if anyone knew the geography of the UCD from those times, and yes, we were close to the centre of the fire that went off at the time, and there was a lot of suspicion drawn to it because it started near our own locker, I'm glad to say it wasn't our fault. David Robbins at the time must have been a source of suspicion because he smoked a pipe. He was very elderly and uh, very um, mature in his, in his young years. But he had as well, he worked as, he worked as a journalist. He was already working uh, in the time when we were all just students. And he went to journalism as a form of craft, as a form of real skilled profession, one that really required independent judgment. And I think one of his chapters was also one of the most important because I think what I read in it, a continuation of his work, that actually having good media on this story is also going to be critical and key. Whatever we do in the political system, it is moderated or interpreted or spread through our media. 
I think we are, I have hope in our country because we have an independent judiciary, we also have an independent media, and it has not, for all its failings, got lost some of the trust that we have seen in other countries for a whole variety of different complex reasons. I think there's still a real challenge because of the stressed state that our media is in, and maybe it's a natural uh, phenomenon that people in media were always chasing ratings, particularly in the current world where social media relies on such you know, attention grabbing and holding and tends towards more devi divisive and less consensus based analysis. It is really important that the work that's been done in DCU and elsewhere in the training of a cadre of independent journalists who can actually consider, criticize, comment on, uh, and help frame this story that we as a people are going to have to share is critical. I won't go through every contribution, I'm conscious of time, David, and several speakers, but I'll finish with two last points. Um, one thing that, if, if, I'm, if my main point is, the sense of hope comes from sense of collective effort and consensus on the need for ambition in this country. It was framed maybe best towards the end by Lorna Gold. She talks about all looking at this climate community that we're all in, about insider insiders and insider outsiders and outsider insiders and all the various different how connected or otherwise to people are to the political system. But she uses or draws a metaphor towards the very end that maybe it's like what you see in take an, an ecological metaphor you see on a reef you see all these different fish within the one habitat all surviving all feeding all living in an ecological way in an in 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 a system and i think that vision for all of us with various different views in this climate issue, the 220 so people listening here must be on because you have a personal connection or vision or importance of this. And I liked that image she had of us as different fish in a system looking to achieve a common goal and objective. And lastly, with Patrick Kirby been missing, I couldn't help but say one last thing, because what he's done and what he says and writes about and what's happening in Clark Jordan um, is an inspiration. I met him recently and he um, gave me or he told me to get Pollyanni's book, The Great Transformation, and made the case that that's where we are now. We're at a point of great transformation where markets serve society rather than society serving markets. And this economics is from the 1940s, I think, when he wrote it. But I think he's right. I think that's where we are today. That's what gives me hope. We're at a point of transformation in the economy as well as in ecology. You need to put the two together. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Minister, for your your very uh, close reading of uh, of the book and your your uh, your comments. And thanks, Dara, for your um, your remarks about the book. I think we got some good quotes for the the jacket of the next edition. Milestone and landmark spring to mind there. So um, we're very happy with those uh, uh, positive responses. And before I hand over to Tara Shine, I just did want to mention some of the chapter authors. And I know Eamon mentioned. Um, many of them there in his contribution. So um, we're, we're foregrounding, <coughs> excuse me, the idea that climate action, while, while driven by climate science, will really only be achieved through, the, through social arenas like politics and media and education, activism and so on. And John Sweeney sets out that context very well in the first chapter, and Dermot Torney in the second uh, sets out the historical policy context. And then we move on to to chapters on law and policy. So Saiv O'Neill and Edwin, Edwin Albus, as Eamon said, give an analysis of you know, litigation as a tool of climate activism and give an account of the uh, Climate Case Ireland decision, that landmark decision. Um, Roderick O'Gorman, who is now, of course, a, a cabinet colleague of Eamon's, uh, looks at climate law in the, in the EU and Ireland. And then Connor Little from UL looks at uh, climate change as a party political uh, um, issue uh, of consensus but low salience, he says. Um, Sabrina Decker looks at how lo the local government sector has responded. And then we move on to a section that deals with communications and discourse. And Declan Fahey's uh, chapter that Eamon mentioned as well ex examines the extent to which um, Ireland can be considered eco modern. We're late, late modernizer, and we're a late eco modernizer as well, he says. Trish Morgan considers the concepts of political ecology. My own chapter looks at how the media, Irish media, have responded to climate change. And Pat Burton looks at cultural and visual responses, including the neglected genre of the Irish zombie movie. Now, I have to say that my favorite line from the book comes from Pat's chapter 
where he quotes someone as saying in the, co in the context of Irish slasher movies that the Hurley is the new chainsaw. So I'm thinking uh, of getting a t-shirt with that, with that uh, uh, on it for, for Christmas. Um, the final section looks at community engagement, education and activism. Claire Watson charts the development of community energy projects. Fanula Waldron, Ben Mallon, Maria Barry and Gabriella Martinez Sands look at approaches to climate change education. Sinead Mercier, Patrick Bresnahan, Damian McElroy and John Barry examine issues around the just transition and the, con the important contributions labor unions have made to the establishment of that context and their importance in um, implementing it. Lorna Gold analyzes the rise of civil society activism, such as the Fridays for Future movement, and Pather Kirby examines the contribution of Clock Jordan Eco Village in modeling low carbon living. So now, after all that, you probably don't need to, to read the book, but I will hand over to uh, Dr. Tara Shine, who I believe has just returned from giving the Royal Institution's Christmas lectures in London. Tara. Good evening, everybody. I was just congratulating you, David and Dermot and Pat on, on an excellent book, uh, as well as all the authors. Um, it's it's, it's a, such a piece of work to put something like this together and you should all be really proud. Um, so reading the book earlier, um, you know, the core question, and one of the core questions you ask at the outset is like, why don't we act? Why haven't we act? And I, I think this is the great conundrum that many of us that have worked in in the field of climate have faced for so long. In fact, uh, last year when I was asked to do um, six minutes of stand-up comedy uh, about climate change, um, that was my question, that was my fundamental thing. You know, imagine in any other job where uh, what you were working on got worse in all the time that you were working on it, um, you, you'd be a complete failure, you would be fired um, in all certainty. Yet for those of us who work on climate, uh, the problem keeps getting worse um, despite our excellent science, despite the evidence, um, despite being able to make the economic case. It's, uh, so that's a real conundrum. And I think the book really explores that conundrum really well. Um, you start off by looking and, and saying that, you know, this is about more than climate science. It's about more than physics, um, which I think is really important. I'm obviously, as a, an environmental scientist, completely uh, wedded to and moved by, just as Eamon Ryan said, he was the core story of the science. Um, you know, I, I, I'm so interested in understanding what the difference is between 1.5 and two degrees of warming. I'm so interested in the fact that this year now, uh, our emissions are up again. Uh, global average temperature is 1.2 degrees this year, but yet we know that 1.5 is a safe upper limit. Um, the, 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 the physics of that, the science of that is, is interesting to me. But I think one reason that we haven't connected enough with people and we haven't been able to act is that we haven't translated our science and made it relevant to uh, the, wider, the wider public and people who are not moved simply by science and graphs or may not speak our language or our jargon. And so I think the emphasis in the book on connecting the physical and social sciences to create more of a people-centered approach is really, really powerful. Um, we heard earlier about the efforts that DCU is making to be an SDG-oriented organization. So um, trying to uh, you know, operate in line with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, all 17 of them. And I think the, the SDGs are a wonderful guide for any of us that want to be able to unpack climate from just a narrow environmental field and to connect it to other things that are important, whether that's gender equality or health or decent work, the connections are all there. I think another thing that is helping us at the moment is the rise in interest in nature-based solutions. Um, I think for Ireland, nature-based solutions and the whole issue of land management is gonna be really important to, to how we take action on climate change, but also to how we engage people. You talk in the book about the connection, the cultural connection we have in Ireland with the land. Well, imagine if we could reframe that connection to be looking after and protecting our land as a carbon store, as a source of resilience, as something that will protect us into a climate affected future. Um, and Eamon mentioned something which is also very close to my heart. He mentioned the need to look at climate from a human rights perspective. 
Um, this is what I worked on all those years with Mary Robinson when we worked together on climate justice was about bringing uh, the human rights aspects of climate change to the fore. So the, the understanding that climate change undermines human rights, but that under climate action done without enough thought can also be undermining of human rights. Yet done well, climate action fulfills and strengthens human rights and gives dignity to all. And that has to be a massive uh, motivator of action and also a motivator of us designing climate action, which is equitable and fair. Um, you know, COVID has shone a light on the fact that when there is a major global risk, it is the people that are most vulnerable that suffer most. And they will be the exact same people, the elderly, uh, those in poor health, those without um, uh, job security that suffer most now in COVID that will suffer most again. And this should you know, enhance our resolve to really build back better, to build back fairer, to build back for all, and to make sure that sustainability, climate action, all 17 SDGs are at the heart of how we rebuild our society in Ireland, across Europe, as part of the Green Deal, but also uh, more widely in, 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 in the world. Um, I really, really enjoyed the focus in the book on, on communications. And I think, as I said, one of the reasons why we, we haven't acted on climate change is we haven't made it relevant to everybody. So one thing that, that Madeleine Murray and I in Change by Degrees talk about all the time around messaging sustainability and climate change is showing people what's in it for them. What does it mean for them? Put yourself in the shoes of the person that you're communicating with and now tell them why climate change or climate action is important to them. If we don't take to th the time to do that, it's never relevant to them. Why should they care? We want people to care. We want them to care enough to change their behavior, to vote differently, to spend their money differently, to invest their money differently. So if we don't take the time to unpack the message and make it relevant to them, then we will never get there. Language is important in that too. I really hold all of us environmentalist, environmentally scienty people um, to cause on this. Language is a massive barrier. We talk about decarbonization like everybody understood what it is. We've done lots of surveys of people. Most people in Ireland, even those who are really well educated, have no idea what decarbonization is, what it really means. So breaking it down, taking the time to use language that everybody understands so that we can connect the facts and the minds with the hearts, just as, as Heyman spoke of earlier, together is really important. It has to be a hearts and minds thing and we can't win it with graphs and data on tons of carbon. It is never going to work. Um, I love the book's message of hope. I am an eternal, or as Christiana Figueres would say, a stubborn optimist. Um, I, there is no lack of solutions holding us back on this why don't we act question. We have solutions, we didn't have the technology. We have the nature that will help us to do this. We just need to act more, greater urgency, invest now in the things that are right. And then hope doesn't have to be something that we just tell our kids stories about at night. Hope becomes something that we're actively doing. We're creating hope by doing that every day through the activities that we engage in. The, the, the last part of the book talks about public engagement and that's very, very, very close to my heart. I absolutely want to democratize the climate action and make it something that is for everybody. So um, no, uh, no insults to the Green Party, but I want, I want sustainability and climate change to be understood as something more than being green. Um, being green, people that identify are, as green are just a small number of us. Um, and we need to make climate change something that belongs to a greater, wider cohort of people, whether they feel like they're green or pink or purple or blue, whatever it is, they, 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 we need to make them all feel invited in. And so we need to lose a focus on being perfect and just have everybody trying to do something and everything a little bit better. Um, for me, then, if in public engagement, we can, we can show that the motivation is about caring for, for people for families, for communities and the environment, we will really get a lot further ahead. And within that, the book also talks about just transition, which is absolutely important. Um, it is an articulation of climate justice in our own national context. If we think about um, peat workers in the Midlands, um, it talks about the need for social dialogue and, and relates that also to farmers. And I think that's really important in Ireland because I think we constantly have the wrong conversation with our farmers. We constantly can't start the conversation with them as the, um, the cause of the problem. They are uh, the cause of the emissions. We, it's, a, it's a mitigation focused conversation where really our farmers are 
the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. They're at risk right now. Are we protecting them? Are we planning for the long term, both in terms of diversifying the economic base for them, um, getting them the right kind of forecast, equipping them with the right tools? And I just think that sometimes removing this overt focus on mitigation, which again is mentioned in the book, and, and looking more broadly at what climate action is in a, across a more sustainable resilience type lens could really help. Um, and, and within that, as the book also emphasizes, agriculture is an area of huge opportunity for us, but we do need to start having the conversation, I believe, from a different place so that we bring this broader cohort of uh, rural people as well into this conversation. We have to get away from this slight perception too that there's an urban rural divide in how we um, talk about climate change. So just to finish up, I guess I just wanted to, to say that, you know, I spend a lot of time thinking about this uh, dichotomy between, uh, you know, is solving climate change, is it, is, it, is it systemic change or is it individual action? It is everything, you know? So that's why I think your idea, David, of a two for one offer on uh, this book and my book is perfect because together that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to, we're trying to engage people in a conversation so they will be supportive of systemic change. We're trying to make them feel like as an individual of agency in the face of an overwhelming wicked problem. Um, but that also, just as we've seen with COVID, when we get government and individuals acting in tandem, that is when we're able to make uh, the greatest change. So uh, I love a quote too from Christiana Figueres, uh, the former executive secretary of the UNFCCC and someone I hugged uh, in to write the foreword of my book, just as uh, Dermot and the guys got Laurence Tubiana to write theirs. Um, she has a quote in her book, uh, which is also a good buy, called, and she says, systemic change is a deeply personal endeavor. And I love that because wherever you have influence and power, using that is part of creating the systemic change that we already need. So whether that means that you're coaching the GAA club or you're president of a university, you have the power to make that systemic change. And now uh, in 2020, we've rewritten the rules of everything. So everything is possible. Everything we were told was impossible in 2019 is now possible again. And I take a great hope and encouragement from that too. So moving on from what we've learned this year, we have a chance to rewrite what is possible and to rewrite the, the rewrite the vision, I guess, that we can have for a better society. And just, to, I wanted to end with this, um, which is a, a, a comment in the book, which says that Ireland has, uh, it's our diplomatic capital has been spent on securing flexibility, I guess, largely within Europe and within the United, the UNFCCC, where we've been trying to get flexibility for our special circumstances. And, and it just struck me how much at odds this statement was from Laurence Tubiana's call to us in the foreword to use our leadership, to punch above our weight, um, to show what potential Ireland has as, as a leader. You talk about it also um, in the introduction. And so I would love Ireland's diplomatic capital to be used on showing that we are empathetic, um, that we're brave, that we're collaborative, and that we act in solidarity with our fellow human beings. Um, and that I absolutely know we can do. So thank you guys for your book. It's a great, great read. Thank you. Thanks a million, Tara, for uh, for those remarks. That call for in inclusivity in in uh, in bringing everybody into the, into the um, the movement for climate action. It made me think of a, a, a phrase Greta Thunberg uses a lot: "Every everyone is needed, and everybody is and everyone is welcome." Um, I'm getting a bit of flack on social media for the fact that I used to smoke a pipe and I'd just like to clarify that I've given that up a long time ago and I promise to offset any emissions that were caused uh, back in those uh, days. So I'm going to um, call on Mark Foley, who's the CEO of the Airgrid Group, to, uh, to say a few remarks uh, about the book. Mark, over to you. Good God, I got the ultimate graveyard shift. Um, so I'll be... I'll be really good. I'll stick to time, six minutes, and I'll. this is as much a stream of consciousness as anything else. Minister, President of DCU, and other distinguished guests and attendees at this signature event, this is the most extraordinary of years in my 59 years of life, and I suggest all of your lives, whether you're young or old. I speak with great admiration about, and indeed envy, at David Dermot Pat. Tara with her own book, and indeed my hero, my brother Greg, Dr. Greg Foley, who lectures in your great university, all of whom have achieved what my 
lifelong unrealized ambition is is to write a book. I'm a bit conflicted whether I take on the great Irish novel or whether maybe I'll give an alternative reflection on business because my business career comprises 18 years in the FDI sector and more recently 20 years in the commercial semi-state sector with the Dublin Airport Authority, Quilta and now Airgrid. I may very well be a unique individual and having worked at senior level and three semi-state companies. My business career has about five years to go. And when staff and people ask me what motivates me, I often tell the following very real life and somewhat poignant story, which emanates from the last year in my personal life. I live in Newcastle and County in beautiful Wicklow and looking out at a dark autumnal night, dark and raining for the last seven and a half years. And more recently, I've experienced of my octogenarian mother-in-law who has been living with Cora and I for the last three years. She suffers from dementia, the most cruel of diseases and a disease which presents some extraordinary contradictions, one of which is extreme difficulties with recollection. By that I mean a conversation two minutes ago is forgotten and, and one is often faced with repeated questions about the same topic for hours on end. Equally and amazingly, one is confronted with extraordinary clarity and lucidity in some act aspects of that questioning. Another awful aspect of that disease is insomnia and um, no sense of time, five minutes to my mother-in-law can seem like many, many hours or indeed days. Pre-COVID, my daily routine involved rising at 5.45 a.m., departing my house at 6 a.m. whereby I would go to the gym in Shelburne Road before seven and be at my desk around 8.15. Well, one morning about a year ago, as I prepared a coffee to bring me to, to help me in my car and get me on my journey to the gym, me in my gym gear, the house freezing as the heat has had yet to come on, my mother-in-law ghosted into the kitchen in her dressing gown. And she engaged in a conversation with me, her in her insomniac state. As I encouraged her to go back to bed, she asked me a few pointed and highly illuminating and lucid questions, quite amazing in terms of the clarity, but also compelling. She said, what are you doing? And I replied, I'm heading to work. Um, it's very early and you should go back to bed and I'm dressed for the gym. I go to the gym before I go to work and it's very, very early. It's dark, it's cold, it's miserable. Her next question was, do I like it? And I had to take, take a, a little bit of reflection and say, what, what's she asking me? And then I realized she, asking me, she asked me, do I like my work? And I said, yes, I do. I do like my work. Her next question threw me a bit by virtue of its clarity and incredible simplicity. And you'll, for those of you who have children, have rare children, you'll recall that, you know, that famous question where your child says, why? They ask you that seminal question of why, when you've got, you tell them to do something or whatever. She said, why? And I gave her, I thought about it. Uh, I thought about the innocence of the question and I said, I like it. I said, I like it because I get to make a difference. And she simply said to me, I understand. And she went back to bed. So I reflect on my privileged role as a leader of one of Ireland's most important companies in the fight against climate breakdown. And I continually ask and demand of myself, I'm here to make a difference. If as a nation we're going to genuinely transition from the laggard and the famous statement of the former Taoiseach, um, Leo Varadkar, to leader. Leaders in terms of business, in terms of academia, in terms of the social scientists, and indeed in politics. You and I carry a huge, onerous, but a rewarding responsibility to stand up and be counted, to be courageous, not to play safe, and not to point the, picture, point the finger into government and policymakers, etc., but to genuinely be courageous, to have an impact and to make a difference, even if it causes you personal pain and even if it causes you anxiety. Today is a day to celebrate another milestone, in my view, in exemplary leadership, because we have a quality storyboard of record, which the authors of this book have created on the critical matter of climate breakdown. And indeed, 
Ireland's relationship with this critical matter for our people, not just our people, but people across the globe. I think about the great value proposition that we as, as, as a people hold dear, which is the one around education, because the cornerstone of our success as a nation has been an educated workforce, an educated people, a commitment to education. And I think what you've done today in terms of that wonderful piece of thought leadership and history and education is you've created something that allows the people of Ireland to connect with a new Ireland, an Ireland which is going to stand up and be counted and embrace the greatest challenge which we face in the history of mankind. This publication helps me as a leader on my journey and my advocacy with my staff, with my stakeholders, etc. And it helps me in my desire and my commitment and what drives me every day I get up at 6 a.m. to make a difference. Since the iconic Citizens' Assembly game-changing work on climate change in 2018, Ireland will never be the same. The Citizens' Assembly has changed how we think, how we act, and how we engage with the political system and how we engage with our people. A groundswell of passion and desire for change, I believe, has been mobilised. And it's incumbent on every one of us in a leadership role to work night and day to educate, to inspire and to change hearts and minds in support of Ireland. Getting to our rightful place, which is to be a beacon of light to the world as an exemplar in a desire to create a carbon free world, both in the societal terms and in terms of work. Thank you for this incredible piece of thought leadership. I bought three copies today, I have to admit. One is from my chairman, who I'm meeting next week for lunch before we close off a tough year with COVID and everything else. One to pass around my board, which I'm going to tell them all to read, and one from my executive team. And it's a credit to you, the quality of this history, not just history, but also the way forward, which you're bringing, bringing to, to, to the people of Ireland. Thank you and well done. You're an inspiration to me personally, and I su suspect others who share the ambition to protect our precious planet for future generations will equally be inspired by this, this piece of wonderful work. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be part of this great occasion. And, uh, and I haven't finished a book, I have to be honest. That's my, I guess it arrived last Thursday, but I'm well through it. And it's, it's, it's a fantastic piece of work. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, and thank you to all our speakers uh, this evening, to, to Tara, to Minister Raymond Ryan, and to President of DCU, uh, Professor Dara Kyo. Um, I hope everybody who, who logged in got something out of our, our contributions this evening. We're, we're, very, we're very proud of, of the book. We're very proud of all our chapter authors and the contributions. And we hope that the book will kind of facilitate discussions and debate about how we can leave behind that, that tag of, of laggard and assume the kind of mantle of leadership uh, about cl uh, around climate action um, in the future. So that brings uh, the proceedings to an end this evening. Thanks again for joining us. Um, the book, as I say, is on sale for 1999. Um, and uh, I hope um, you've enjoyed this evening's event. Thank you. <laughs>